Hello everyone, my name is Michelle Angelo Rocha and I'm a PhD candidate in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of South Florida. The following videos is a shot that was recorded at the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry, ICQI 2021. This is the first video of four sections. This project was organized by the editors of the book, Analyzing and Interpreting Qualitative Research at the Interview, Dr. Charles Vanover, Paul Mijas and Johnny Saldana, and published by SAGE. In this first section, you will learn about data collection and engage interpretation after the interview. The first presentation is exploring the impacts of meditation and yoga practice as arts-based research methodological practice by Michelle Angelo Rocha from the University of South Florida. The second presentation is after someone's interview with Cherry Shetfield from Kent State University. And the last presentation is Better with Pictures with Dr. Sally Capabel Gama from the University of Massachusetts at Harmast. And the discussant is Paul Mijas from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So get comfortable and enjoy the section number one. Hello, um, my name is Dr. Charles Vanover. I am the co-editor of our book, Analyzing and Interpreting Qualitative Data After the Interview. So this session is about content that is at the heart of our book, which is memo writing um, and providing a really rich set of strategies to do to create memos from qualitative analysis. And in my view, just in my professional opinion, um, the quality of the memos directly impacts the possibilities for writing. It's a critical strategy. And um, so we will begin with Paul Myhouse, who is the other co editor, another co editor of the book, discussing um, strategies for memo writing. And his paper is titled. Um, memo writing strategies, analyzing the parts in the whole. Um, in the next um, paper, we'll have a video from Elaine Keen from the National University of Ireland, Galway. And she too will discuss memoing as a core generative tool of qualitative analysis. Elaine worked extensively with um, Kathy Shermes and um, and so I think that, you know, the two chapters, the two presentations will be um, very rich. Then we're gonna shift into another interpretive paper by Jamie Lee Fiddler from the University of Calgary. And Jamie will discuss some of the key ideas from her chapter, Listening Deeply, an alternative approach to the analyst of focus group data. And she'll discuss the importance of really listening and hearing to full tapes as a process to sort of understand the full import of the conversation before engaging in analysis. Um, our discussion, Johnny, co-editor Johnny Saldana from Arizona State University will discuss things and will discuss all three chapters. And then Sage Publishing's Helen Solomon will join the panelists at the end for the concluding discussion. So our first first panelist is Michelle um, Roja, um, and so Michelle, spell your name. Michelle Angelo Rocha. <laughs> who is a graduate student at University of South, South Florida. Um, she worked does art space research with um, migrants and other vulnerable populations, and. Um, she is also the host of our um, video series. So uh, my presentation is Explore the Impacts of Meditation and Yoga Practice as Arts-Based Research methodolo Methodological Approach. 
Um, but before I explain my what I, my research and what I'm doing, I want to share a little bit about my positionality. I came to the United States in 2010 as I am. I left my job in Brazil as a journalist to come here to learn English. In 2010, to take care of Katie, she was a I was an au pair, and um, and since since then I have been here living United States trying to learn English, and that's when I finished my master's, the second picture. Since I finished my master's, and now I'm get, I'm in my third year of my PhD program, I'm not able to see my family due to my own immigration status. And this is really start to impact my own emotions. So, and during my research, during my master's, I was doing research, interviewing victims of human trafficking. And I was really, I was really, I really want to figure out ways I can um, impact my commodity. And so I started working as a substitute teacher in the public schools. And that was the day when I discovered my own research I was working with those kids and this day, they, they barely know how to speak English, just like me when I came to the United States. And during, during our class, I was talking to them and, and their job was to read, to, read, to read a British literature book because they have a test in the next week. And I noticed that after I told them their assignment, something was wrong. I could feel that something was wrong and I couldn't understand why because I was just there being a to teacher that day. After a few minutes, I figured out a way to, I learned that they couldn't read English. And I sit with them and I said, look, I know what's going on here and I wanted to share my story with you. So I sit with them and I read and I said, like, we are going to read this book together and we are going to understand this book together, just like I, I did when I came to the United States. So that day, I remember a lot of them, they, could, they didn't want to read. And I said, no, we are going to read and you are going to read. But here, nobody's going to be here to judge you. We are going to read together. And in the end of the class, they came to me and I had to take a picture with them because they gave my research. And that's the day when I discovered my dissertation. What's the experience of immigrant children? And I remember the la this last student in the back, the little one, he came to me and he told me, teacher, how did you learn how to learn English? How do you do? And I remember when he didn't wanna read, and he, but in the end of the class, his eyes was shining so much. And he just gave my hug and said, I'm gonna learn English. All those kids, they, so this is that day, I want to understand what we can do to help my immigrant community. So during this process, I was also working as a, a substitute, as, as well, I was working as a volunteer helping refugees. And I, I was working for two years and I faced, I discovered the same issues. Um, how the education is not prepared to help the immigrants and how, especially when you are working with traumas, all those kids, all, all them, they had stories, they have to leave Cuba and they had to go through all South, South America to arrive in the United States because when they get in the land of the United States, they could have their, they could be, they would be okay with the immigration, but all of them, they went through traumas. And during this process, and it was also bothered me because I, ha I saw so many problems in the system that we need to, to change to help, to, uh, to help our community, especially the ones who, who doesn't know how to speak the, the language. So that the day when I start to, so that's when I, before I went and I, I, I got us up in my, my PhD program. And during, do, during the, my classes, I took a class called arts-based research. That's when I fell in love with, with arts-based research. And I want to go to, I want to try to understand the experience of immigrant children. So I, I went to a school and I start to, I want to understand their stories. And what I did was I sit with them and I create a space where I could, I put yoga music and we work on meditation and breathing techniques before, because I want to understand the experience through arts. But before we talk about all those uh, issues, I want to make them comfortable with me. I want they understand my story. I want they understand the reason why I was conducting this research and why I want to listen to their stories. But I saw through meditation, I saw through yoga, and that's how I do in my own life. I use, I, I meditate every day, and how I can use this to, 
to listen to the stories of my, my immigrant children. And I sit with the, the children and, uh, and I put them yoga music and I, I start to work with them with the breathing techniques. And I share with them my own story as a, a person who is trying, was trying to learn English and who can see my family since um, for six years. So we sit on a table after we did the, the, the yoga meditation and they had a space they could, so they were able to, to create, to paint. They chose what they want to do. So, but I think this technique that using breathing and meditation and yoga was so important. And I want to keep using doing this in my research because you can just, you also analyze yourself during this process. You connect your, with your research participants, but we also try, you, the environment is different. You can see that your participants can connect with you and you can show them that you care about them. So I think this for me was very open. I, I didn't know in the beginning when I was trying to do this, but now I want to keep using yoga meditation because I really want to keep working with vulnerable communities. And I saw that as an amazing technique to, to listen before, uh, to listen to their stories. So I want to share with you after the, the breathing techniques that we did, I want to share with you a little bit of the stories that I heard. So Carlos, um, Carlos, Carlos, he was from Cuba and he shared with me his feelings. He was after the, the technique, after the yoga, he told with me like how he feel pain and how I feel that my family and friends go through, through so much. And I know my, my, my uncle got deported after living four years in the United States just because they found a criminal record for a long time. So I think through this, listening to their stories and seeing their paintings, I could see microaggressions. Of, I could see uh, their pain, their student pain, and their, their self-esteem through this process. So, um, so that's one of the, the students that I, I, I had the opportunity to talk uh, Gonzalez, also from Cuba, he was telling me that um, when he, when he, when she was in elementary school, they, they were accusing of bad things. Some of the students used to tell me that uh, as a, we Latinas, we are sorry, the word bitches. Um, they also used to make fun of us because we didn't know how to speak English. So I think all this environment was so important because I they felt connected and they could share with me their stories and. Um, some of the issues that they face with educators. I had a problem with a teacher. My mom told me that to record when she, when my teacher was mean to me and, and this, this child, she used to record, uh, to use a, a recorder under the table. So she, be, she could record the microaggression that she was facing in schools. And one of the, uh, Gonzalez, she was, um, uh, she had to leave the room and cry sometimes when they were sharing their stories, so when she was sharing their stories. So I think that's uh, one of the good ways to use the arts and also using a meditation to talk to kids in vulnerability. Um, sorry, I can't see the name here. Uh, Joanna from Mexico, um, she was telling how she felt worried, how she was about the immigration status of her family, how her dad was deported. And one day she was at school and people were um, laughing at her because she was considered an alien. And, and that's how they call Mexicans. So all, so all those stories of microaggressions and uh, immigration status, how their gender, how their race, how that ethnicity impact their emotion in, in schools. So um, Joanna from Mexico, she used to say that, she also told me that she felt she sometimes she felt worthless. Um, the idea of being Mexicans as always connect to criminality and the limits that she faced uh, and how her she saw her mom being being beaten in being beaten in the class uh, in a in a house in a family. So uh, so that's one of the stories that I heard. So my findings with my research is like I said before, yoga and breathing techniques and use arts to listen, especially stories of children is so, uh, I think it, we need to, there is a need for more research like that because you are, as a researcher, you also analyze your ethics 
and also your connection with your research participants, and also you analyze yourself, your own positionality, and how you talk about, and how you interview, how you connect with your research participants, and how you write. I think is at least in my life is being fundamental, and I think is uh, I want to keep doing that. And also the other finds that I found is the students they felt more comfortable with me. And especially when I was sharing my own story and I could connect with them. And, and during this process, with, during this process, I was also, they, uh, they were teaching, they were also teaching me as a, uh, as a research participant. So that's some of the finds that I found in my research. So thank you so much. Is, uh, so that's how I use yoga and breathing techniques to, in arts to, to, share, to listen to the stories of immigrant children. So I just want to finish here. It, as educators, we need to know what happens in the world of the children with whom they work. They need to know the universe of the dreams, the language with which they skillfully defend themselves from the aggressiveness of their world, what they know independ independently of the school and how they know it. So thank you so much. Could you talk a little bit from Silvana, like how did the how do you think the meditation shaped the stories? What was the what was the, so they trusted you? Did you, did you talk about the difference? Okay. In the beginning, they, in the beginning, they, they, they were kind of weird. They like, they didn't want to, they were not like, what are you doing here? Why are you doing research? Uh, why are you, why are you doing a listen to our stories? So they didn't want to, they were kind of, okay, I don't know what I'm doing here. But when I said, I think when the moment that when I put them, we sit in circle, and everybody, there is no, there is no this connection, this thing about the researcher and the the students, like this power relation didn't happen, didn't happen there. And we sit all together. And I put when I put the music, the when and when we start, when I start to work with them with uh, please breathe. And that's I think when we connected. I think this is using the music especially was so because i think they were like and especially when i told them my own story um i didn't want i was like i don't know if i should share my story but i think sharing my story was also make them um make me I, I was vulnerable to share my story and they could feel that there is a reason why i'm doing this and the same so that's the how um so that's when when i did the yoga i think with uh uh this process of the music sitting together on the floor and no power relations and just I want I'm here to listen to you and I'm when you listen to me but we are here to help each other I think that was uh was very empowering me as a researcher and to see and to know how because I think also this moment was very how can I say that? Um, made me feel vo very connected to my research participants and they feel connected with me. I hope I answer your question. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, Cheryl, you're up. I'm, a, I'm in a college of public health. And so I'm an interdisciplinary uh, researcher. I do a lot of health behavior research, but I also have a background um, as a recreational therapist. So I do um, engage in some more arts-based and um, other kinds of uh, creative research. So today I am um, going to talk about um, what I called after someone else's interview, considerations in qualitative secondary analysis. I had my first opportunities to practice secondary analysis of qualitative data in uh, qualitative data analysis courses that I took as part of my PhD. Um, notable projects that you will never see published include lingering impacts of Hurricane Floyd, a qualitative descriptive study, which was informed by analysis of data um, transcripts housed in the Documenting the American South Archive hosted at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, um, and a grounded theory of the process used by two women physicists in the early 20th, early 20th century to succeed in a male-dominated discipline. And those are based, that was based on interview transcripts from the Bohr Library and Archives managed by the American Institute of Physics. So I was introduced to these rich data sources as a student. And I think that many, for many people, that's um, the center of their experience with secondary analysis. 
is either as a student in a class where someone pointed you to uh, data or as an instructor of your own classes where you've pointed your students to archives to use to practice usually um, basic analysis techniques. But in the past few years, I've started to more seriously explore use of qualitative and mixed method secondary analysis to really to inform credible, credible, engaging and useful research that's suitable for publication or other kinds of dissemination. So these uses um, outside of the classroom are the focus of my presentation. And I'll briefly describe a couple of examples and talk about advantages of qualitative secondary analysis as a research approach and uh, also talk a little about challenges and criticisms and offer some recommendations. This is the definition that um, I developed for the book chapter, any process researchers use instead of, or in addition to the stated purpose that guide, guided the original data collection. Uh, this includes doing a reanalysis of your own data, which is maybe a little more common even than use of archives. Meta studies are actually a secondary analysis and then use of publicly available data from archives. Um, these publicly available data may be the source data from prior research, maybe panel data like longitudinal surveys that have an unstructured or qualitative element. But um, primarily what I'm interested in are collections like oral histories and other topical interview collections, because these provide the richest sources of data. Um, sources for these kinds of data usually uh, primarily include university libraries, uh, special collections, museums and historical societies, professional associations and interest groups. As I mentioned in the one practice um, assignment that I'd done, I found the interviews in the um, American Society Institute of Physics where they actually house some interviews with physicists. Uh, other data repositories and what you can find are audio recordings, video recordings, text transcripts and photographs and other visual data. And um, if you're really lucky, you can find both audio recordings and text transcripts. So just to go through a couple of examples, actually a few examples, um, because I'm here at Kent State, um, I'm very aware of the Kent State University May 4th special collection. And um, what we have here are contributed text narratives, other documents, photographs, and audio recorded interviews with text transcripts. And I should give you a little background because not everyone is gonna know about um, the Kent State Vietnam War protests in 1970. It's something that we talk about all the time here, but so you tend to take for granted that everyone else knows. Um, on May 4th, 1970, students at Kent State University gathered to protest troop escalation during the Vietnam War. Due to vandalism and property damage during the prior weekend, which included uh, burning down the, um, Reserve Officers Training Corps building on campus and some damage in town, the governor of Ohio and the mayor of Kent decided to send Ohio National Guard troops to Kent. Um, during a protest, a student protest on campus, the guard troops fired into a crowd of students and no one's sure exactly what precipitated that um, and why it happened. Four students were killed, including one who was not part of the protest and was just walking to, to class and several other people were injured. Um, I would say until recent years, the um, commemoration was very subdued and it wasn't something that people wanted to talk about. And then in the last 20 to 30 years, um, the university and the community started to embrace this as part of their history and um, to emphasize that this, this violent protest or this violent ending to a protest helped turn the tide of public opinion toward away from the Vietnam War and was a contributing factor to uh, the lack of US involvement to pulling the troops out of Vietnam. So this is commemorated annually. And one aspect of the commemoration was the creation of the May 4th archive curated by the university library. So um, this was the source of this study that I'm gonna talk about. For this project, um, oh, and the contributors include former students, other people, who just felt like they were impacted by the incident and then area residents, including adolescents in 1970. And that's who we keyed in on. Um, my research group was very interested in adolescent mental health. So we were trying to find a way that we could use some information from this archive to address um, our actual existing research interests. And we found seven interviews with individuals who were at that time adolescents. Uh, these included retrospective reflection of the impact of exposure to the 
incident up to 40 years later. Um, we use the phenomenological qualitative analysis approach. And a key finding was um, not surprisingly that later events, similar events like campus shootings and less similar events like the terror attacks of 9-11 triggered stress responses even 40 years later in these individuals. Uh, same research group has also worked with National Violent Death Reporting System data from the US CDC. It's a mix of categorical and unstructured case narratives um, with context and circumstances of homicide and death by suicide. These are restricted access data, so have to be um, obtained through an application process, unlike the prior data set, which was entirely public and is not even de-identified. Um, so, but this is a contrasting kind of research that we, um, that we have, uh, or data that we've used secondary analysis on. Um, with the MVDRS data, we have more cases and fewer and smaller bits of information per case. But unlike some of the other researchers who have worked with this data, we, uh, we do open coding, uh, meaning unit coding, and do more descriptive, but begin to approach some interpretive analysis of these data rather than just doing a strict categorical um, kind of approach, which is what most researchers do with the NVDRS data. Um, during this current semester, while I was teaching a data analysis class of my own, I came upon Project Juke Jukebox um, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which was not a data archive that I had seen before. Um, and I found interview, individual interviews on climate change perceptions. And so I gave my students a grounded theory coding assignment using these. Um, and I'm actually interested enough in this that um, I'm talking to some other people who have an interest in climate change um, and perceptions of that. And we're in the process of developing a proposal um, and, a, and a plan to see if we can do some kind of a, make some kind of a research project out of this very nice data set. So those are just a few examples of um, different kinds of secondary analysis projects. Um, clear advantage is the sort of recycling aspect of this, reuse of existing resources and making the most out of them, because a lot of time and effort goes into every research, every qualitative research project. Um, and I tend to think that as qualitative researchers, we're taking a lot from participants and not giving much back. Um, and this varies a lot. And clearly our first in the prior presentation, um, there was a very participatory and sharing element of that. Um, but a lot of the people that I'm around in more of the pragmatic public health world just want to get data from people. So I think that as many ways as you can use participants' contributions, that just makes them more and more meaningful. It also avoids um, re-traumatization in some cases. You're not asking someone to describe an emotional incident over and over again. You're finding someone else's data where they've done that. Um, this can be a massive savings in researcher time and effort. And identifying and recruiting participants in a non-pandemic world is difficult. It's, um, I would have to say, a year and a half ago when I started really thinking about um, the methodological impacts of secondary analysis, I was not thinking about um, the, the um, advantage that it would give me during a pandemic. But this has proven to be a pandemic-resistant kind of research approach. Uh, so no, no time in identifying and recruiting participants. Data gathering and processing is streamlined. Um, you may have to do some transcripts, but it it's, doesn't take that much time, I don't think, to do a transcript if someone else has already done the interview. Um, and in the case of my uh, institutional review board, they will give an expedited approval for use with secondary anal analysis. Uh, we do still have to seek an approval, but it's an expedited shortcut process. Um, and can give you access to difficult to access individuals and groups, which depending on your location and resources as a researcher, you may not be able to actually do interviews with the kind of people that you're interested in. And you may find that someone else has already done that. Also with historical data, um, you know, you've lost that window and it may still be out there. The data may be out there. Um, <clears throat> the biggest concerns that people that are researchers talk about are the lack of control over the research process. Um, and as Patton wrote, the researcher is the instrument, and this can make it challenging to use someone else's gathered data. Making your interests fit the data that are available may require a flexible um, approach and some compromise. Um, those who contribute to oral histories or research in repositories have typically consented to research use but there still, um, I think, needs to be an awareness of how you're going to represent these data 
and the, uh, the intent of the original consent. If you're being very critical of people's circumstances or context, um, I think you have to think, think about that very carefully. Um, you may have less contextual knowledge and um, the data may not have been gathered to meet your particular orientation or framework. Um, you can't really impose your personal preferences and guiding research frameworks on how data are gathered when they're secondary data. So, you know, the, the um, simple sort of overall answer to those concerns is that qualitative secondary data um, doesn't work for all research interests, uh, but it may work well for some. Um, my recommendations, I, I advise and, and encourage my students to explore existing data to guide or supplement your primary research um, and to engage with your data as if it is your own data. Select wisely, I say, and that, um, that relates to my May 4th study. For all three of the researchers, we had some personal context with that incident, whether it was from being in the area or from having friends or relatives who were a little older and were um, more aware or involved or peripherally involved. And that really made this easier for us than it been, if it had been something completely unknown. Um, but, you know, consulting other resources to try to immerse yourself into the context. Um, I think there's a tendency to default to sort of the thematic or descriptive analysis. And I suggest that people consider various approaches with these data. I think that um, qualitative secondary analysis can form a nice part of a mixed methods or a grounded theory or a case study kind of design where you may be able to use multiple data types. So it may not be your primary or your only data, but it may supplement something else. Um, I know that some people have taken other people's interviews and then used those to develop their own guides and build on an existing data set and supplementing it with new interviews or additional interviews. Um, and lastly, I encourage everybody to find ways to archive their own data. And this may involve broadening the consent uh, wording to uh, ensure that your participants are aware that you may be interested in doing this and making the data available for other researchers or giving them the opportunity to choose whether to agree to that or not. Um, trying to find places that you can um, you know, house the data for the long term, like your institutional library. In the US, we don't have a central repository for like funded qualitative research data, as you might find in the UK and uh, maybe other parts of the world. So this is something that, um, that hopefully will be coming. And right now, the big sort of aggregate data um, places like the um, Inter-University Consortium out of U of Michigan, that's mostly quantitative data. So, um, you know, maybe one by one, um, the way that we work as qualitative researchers, sort of doing um, our one by one things to, uh, to create a, to look, for, to create a bigger trend um, over time, maybe we will find a, a way to increase the amount of archive data and promote the use of it so that future researchers continue um, to consider this as part of their research process. Um, and there's a few of the, um, um, boy, I'm running out, of, running out of gas already. I guess it's because it's Friday. Um, but here's a few sources that I cited um, and some other, some uh, archive places. And there's actually an appendix in the book chapter that has a list of sources for secondary data. And that's what I've got. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And I just want to say that, you know, one of the hopes for this chapter in this book is that we could start advocating for these archives, right? And it, particularly the idea of um, not re-traumatizing people, not putting burdens on them. There's so much stuff um, for pandemic and other things like that. It's just critical for us to start thinking about how we could do a better job um, doing that and resist this effort by IRB to um, this destroy very valuable content for very strange reasons that don't make much sense. Okay, we are going to have um, Sally, you're up. You can go. I'm going to share my screen real quick. 
just never gets easier, does it? Okay. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Okay, great. All right. Um, so this presentation, which I'm hoping comes in under 15 minutes, uh, is called It's Better With Pictures. And this is about using comics, drawing, and doodling to make sense of qualitative research. And this is connected to my chapter um, in the book that we've been talking about. Uh, and I also have some images from the chapter as little teasers to whet your appetite when I talk about how I do this thing that I do. Uh, really quick, you know, what is even my story? So uh, my name is Sally Campbell Silverman. I got married last week, so I'm trotting out my new name. Um, but I was Sally Campbell Gallman, and that's probably where you've seen my work. It's a super weird thing to do at this stage in your career, but whatever. So I'm professor of child and family studies at UMass. I'm the person behind the, um, whoops, I'm the person behind the uh, uh, Shane the Lone Ethnographer comics. So I've been doing art um, as part of my scholarship for a very, very long time. I was a cartoonist in higher ed before it was acceptable for a tenure and promotion. Um, and I've published a lot. I do research on gender and childhood and arts and comics-based research. And if you wanna see more about the kinds of things I do, you can uh, check out my website, which is sallycampbellsilverman.com. Um, I also recently finished illustrating a medical textbook. So I do a lot of different kinds of scholarship around um, what is the image and how can it be used? Um, but this, what I'm gonna be talking about today is a little bit different because I'm going to be talking about how the image and image making, which, and again, I'll talk about this, everyone can do, is a window into the transformative power of doing really deep data analysis with qualitative, uh, qualitative methods. Okay, so qualitative research is primarily an exercise in storytelling. But storytelling is a transformative process when it's done correctly. Um, I believe really uh, strongly that part of doing really high quality data analysis with qualitative data is not only being willing to go there and really engage and get up to your neck and your data, but also willingness on the part of the researcher to be transformed, to be transported to a place um, of different understanding. And part of this is because um, like um, Shelley and also um, other people that have that, that do work with marginalized populations, um, it's heavy, right? It's heavy. And I think, you know, I wrote a piece in 2017, uh, which was a comic, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, where I was talking about what does the researcher do with that pain? And how are you supposed to get into data analysis when the process of doing so transports you to a really potentially traumatic place. Okay, so narrative, as Weaver Hightower, who is one of my favorite scholars in image-based work, says narrative, especially, perhaps especially including comics, gives access to empathy and insight into experience that resides centrally in the aims of ethnographic, in my case, I'm an ethnographer research. So it's a process of taking storytelling and doing something with it. Um, so kind of to back up a little bit, um, comics-based research, which is what I do, is a form of arts-based research that relies on that kind of transformation. Um, I've said before, this is also a transformation of the artist and the scholar, right? So commonly we think about arts-based research as about dissemination, right? You make the art to tell about what you did. And because it is art, it can access people at an emotional and different level and lots and lots of people have written about this and it's it's super important um so i've talked about this here i am this is my thing my website is there there we go um this is the quote that i was talking about for a very long time and here we are all caught up um so the arts again arts-based research we think about it as primarily about dissemination um, because we share the arts or about data gathering. A lot of the research I've done with gender and childhood has used the arts as a mechanism for gathering data, data collection. But I think something that's left out of the equation, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit today is how arts-based research, or in my case, comics-based research can be used for data analysis. And when I teach arts-based research, as a, I teach a doctoral seminar on arts-based research here at UMass, um, and even in my advanced arts-based research seminar, people are always like, well, wait a minute, the sticking point is analysis, how do you, how do you do data analysis by drawing, right? And just a quick show of hands, how many of you are kind of like, I don't know about the drawing with the data analysis, right? It's a little weird. It's a little bit of a suspension of disbelief, but we're gonna get there. So I want you to kind of hold that idea in your head. Like what is the, why is that weird? 
So the term comics-based research, which is a form of arts-based research, was initially coined by Marcus Weaver Hightower and his co-authors, um, Susanna and Kuttner. Um, and it, frankly, um, locates comic art with under the umbrella of the visual arts, which is kind of a thing. With comics and cartoonists, um, there are serious legitimacy issues. You know, comics have long been considered sort of sub-literature for the sub-literate, right? There's pictures because nobody can read. That's, that's the, or it's supposed to be some sort of, um, like I remember when I was a kid in the 70s, seeing the ads on TV for the comic classics, like no one could really understand Moby Dick, so you'd get a comic done that way because it made it easier. Um, and the world of comics has been historically also a pretty deeply sexist kind of basement dwelling landscape of creepiness. Um, and it's not a friendly place for women. Um, I used to go to the big comic conventions as a comic artist and illustrator, and there would be three other women and we'd all just kind of cowering in a corner because it was endless kind of sexist imagery everywhere and there was no place for us. So there's definitely legitimacy issues. There's definitely a lot of weight in the comic industry, but I go ahead and identify as a cartoonist and a comic artist within the umbrella of comic art uh, and visual art because I, I think it's important to kind of foreground what that is and grapple with that legitimacy stuff. So comic art is defined widely, uh, but typically it's sequential with contiguous words and images. So all comic art is visual art, but not all visual art is comic art. But all comic art has to have words and images on the same page. And that's the end of the definition right there. Okay, can everybody see the, um, let me check, there's another chat, make sure nothing is weird. All right, great, thanks, Shelley. So comics-based research is not, CPR at CBR, is the practice of employing the systematic practices and tools used in the creation of comic art to collect, analyze, or disseminate qualitative data. End of story. That's it. So we use the tools of comic art creation to engage with data, to collect it, to analyze it, to disseminate it. Um, this is interesting because I think all of us have really fantastic deep training in how to do qualitative research, both data collection, data analysis, and dissemination of qualitative studies, but there are limits to that training. And I think when we come into um, data or fieldwork experiences or other things that really have a lot of stuff, that could be traumatic stuff, it could be joy, it could be sadness, what all these, these things are, I find that my training as a qualitative methodologist, don't, it doesn't do anything for me to navigate that, but my training as a visual artist does. And I'm going to get back to you about how those are ultimately um, complementary skills, even though the arts-based research privileges the skills of it as an artist to getting to the data. Whoops. Okay. So, so this is a page from the book. Um, this is, uh, talks about arts-based research and comics-based research as a broad set of practices that use the comic form to collect, analyze, or disseminate scholarly research. Right, so this is, this is what I had from the book. And you can see that looking at this is a very different experience than if I was to write a paragraph on a page. I'm forced into a certain degree of economy by this format because um, as the editors of the volume know, I insist on hand lettering everything as a meditative practice and a practice at economy. Every word has to count for 400 other words because I only have room for this much on a page and if it gets too small, no one can read it. So there's something different happening in creating a message on a page like this that works for some people and doesn't work for others, but definitely the economy and the style and the impact that I want it to have, um, how I want the page movement to work for the reader. Um, it's different than writing a document in Word. It's not harder, it's not easier, although I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's harder, um, but it definitely creates something totally different. And I'll show you some more pages in a minute. So drawing as a process of analysis allows me to engage differently and to be transformed by the data that I'm working with. Um, Weaver Hightower wrote that comics scaffold the analyst's cognition in a different way. And narrative, especially, this is again the same quote, including comics give access to empathy and insight into experience that resides centrally in the aims of qualitative research, right? So I, and it's not to say that you can't access empathy any other way, like you have to draw or you're like an unfeeling statue. That's not how it works. Rather, I believe that by drawing the story or drawing meditatively on what I'm learning from the data takes me to a place that allows me to engage differently. So, so there's a lot of qualitative artists who do comics or comic artists who do what we might call qualitative research. And two big ones that you may or may not have heard is Linda Berry and Nick Susanis. So uh, Linda Berry's book, 100 Demons is, 
I mean, she's a genius, like legitimately MacArthur Foundation says so. Um, and she's who I want to be when I grow up. But 100 Demons is a really beautiful meditation on form and feeling and documenting almost an auto ethnographic approach. Um, using graphics. And of course, Nick Su Susannis is a whole nother story. Um, really technically very, very different. Um, his book, Unflattening, is, is absolutely amazing as a piece of qualitative reporting. And I would also say analysis. So if you're interested in qualitative comics, um, I highly recommend checking out these two folks. Um, uh, Marcus Weaver Hightower is not a cartoonist, but he does publish with artists. I think he's published with Nick. Um, and he's definitely somebody whose work um, to check out as well. And he actually pioneered publishing a comic piece in a journal, which is, you know, 10 years ago could not be done. So it's a big deal. Whoops, it's advanced. Okay. So now everybody's wondering, now that I've talked about how great it is to do comics-based work and data analysis, how do we do this thing? How do we do it? Um, it's a little bit for me like the memo process mixed with constant comparative method. Um, it's a process of coming up with images while meditating on the words and the data and exploring what pricks up my ears, like Peshkin's hot spots and cold spots, and then using those images to drive a closer examination of the data. Um, it's a process, like all data analysis, of opening up the data, and in this case, also opening up the researcher to what is there and what can be there. And I have my little person, whoa, because that's what it's like. Okay. So... I wanna take you through the images from the book of the three steps of how to do this comics. Everyone can do it. The step one, first step I think I do is I read through absolutely everything. I know everybody does this. You get your data, I put it in a binder, I go through, I read it, I take my notes, read and draw and read and draw and sketch the things that come to mind while I'm reading. Um, hard copy is not the most efficient and environmentally okay thing, but that's just what I do because the work of discovery is not efficient. Um, and there we have it. So the first step is reading and drawing and taking notes in a memo style. The second step is what I call in the book, following the headlights. And that means that's a reference to um, a quote from E.L. Doctorow that when you're writing, you can only see as far as the headlights of the car, you know, metaphorically speaking. So you're, you're kind of, you can't always see where you're going, but you can see like five feet ahead and you have to trust. It's an exercise in trust. So I wrote, remember those hot spots and cold spots, those pointed you in a direction and now you have to follow them being open to discovery and also disconfirming data. So when I'm drawing and I'm reading, I'm pricking at my ears. What are the images that are speaking to me? Trusting my senses and drawing and writing until a shape emerges. And the third piece is what Weaver Hightower calls restoring, where we put the words and images and all the things that we took from the data back together to make sense, to make a story in layers about how things come together in words and with pictures using the comic structure that you've made. So, I promised you an example, and this is an example of a time that I use qualitative, uh, I use comic-based research as a qualitative data analysis strategy. So the time I did this thing. Um, I do a lot of research with transgender children. And um, I started in around 2014-15, um, back when it wasn't even a conversation nationally. Um, and I've been following families all this time, looking at their children and looking at what the children are doing. I have a group in the UK, um, I have a group in the US and a group in Germany and I was just merrily collecting my data. I was supposed to go collect data the day after the US election in 2016, but Spencer Foundation called me and said, we really don't want you traveling today. And because it wasn't a safe time to go say to the Midwest and drive around asking transgender people to out themselves to you. Um, so that was horrible. And I ended up talking on the phone with some families and then a couple months later going out into the field and just talking to parents and children who were just terrified and gutted and um, flattened completely by what, what was happening. Um, the sort of, as um, Lindy West says, the zoetrope, right? Of crazy that was happening. Um, and while I was, I was collecting that data, it was incredibly emotional. I'm also the parent of a transgender child. So that makes things even heavier for me. Um, and when I came home and I started going through the data and drawing and thinking, I thought about, um, I wanna say um, Bob Dylan's song about the lion's mouth opens and you're staring at its teeth. And that was the thing that made my hair stand on end and I just drew the lion's mouth over and over and over again. And I thought the whole time I was drawing, I was, I was taking the data and I was discerning from the data fear. 
But by doing this drawing over and over and over again, I found an organizing theme. The fear was mine, but in the context of my participants, the story was bravery. Because if you know the song, you're standing, you're, the lion's mouth is open and you're staring at its teeth, but you are unfazed. So as I wrote and I drew and I worked with figuring out where the headlights were taking me and analyzing the story of this fieldwork experience, I realized that I drew these things over and over again because the story wasn't really about doom and danger and grief. It was about bravery. So that transformation would not have been possible in terms of uncovering that organizational, um, you know, sort of lamppost um, if I had not had this just meditative drawing memoing practice as I read through the data. So we're probably out of time, but um, I want to kind of close with a few things. First of all, anyone can do this. Anyone can draw. I have never had an art class in my life. Anyone can do this if you practice. And I recognize, I encourage anyone to read Linda Berry on representationalism. You need to get away from the idea that it needs to look like something and start with just drawing just to express the, 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 the kinesthetic work of making a line on the page. And that's what I want to do. Um, I would encourage anyone who's interested to start drawing today uh, by telling a story from your data in pictures and images without worrying about contiguousness is really great. Um, I always say this, haters gonna hate. There's always gonna be people who tell you that this isn't real and it's not legitimate and it's not fancy enough to be considered methodology. Um, they're always out there. I get emails from them, ignore them. They, they, everybody loves to hate. Um, and this is totally a legitimate form of scholarship. Um, don't let anyone tell you it's not, but it's really important to become familiar with the standards of rigor and trustworthiness. Um, the best place I find when to get some language to talk about how we ensure standards of rigor and the idea of trustworthiness um, and worthiness is Kahneman and Sigismund's second edition book. And then there's another book that's not about arts-based research uh, from Django Parrish and Maisha Wynn, uh, Humanizing Qualitative Research. Uh, where they talk about being the worthy witness. And these are great places to go. Um, it's not that you sort of, you know, draw and then you're done. You have a lot of other work to do in terms of interpreting what's finding there, but it's really a process of identifying, you know, where are the things that make you prick up your ears and why? Whew. Um, and again, in the book, just to say, um, we have a um, it's and it was just such a lovely experience to see it grow and stuff like that. We just had a blast. Paul, my house, um, you are up. Um, thanks, folks, for, for being here. I guess I, um, I'm very much, I mean, so many things happen in my mind right now, it's hard to contain everything. But I wanted to start asking the presenters to um, tell us a little bit about reflexivity in your work and how you engaged it. Um, for, for example, Sally, I'm, I'm wondering. Like, did you did you draw when you're feeling things? Did you draw draw that? Um, and Cheryl, I know that in your chapter you talked about the depth of emotions you felt, even though you didn't conduct those interviews. And so, and then um, Michelle, of course, you also talked about your own your own um, your own pro, you know your, your sort of um, your own emotions, your own story, and how. You know, I'm just wondering how you engage your, your reflexivity in your work. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I should start. I don't know if it's. Uh... When I was that's when I went to talk to the students, I created so many a lot of expectations in my head. Oh, they are gonna be excited to share their stories, and they're gonna all those paintings, they are gonna draw, they are gonna be excited. And I create all those expectations. But when I went to the field, I noticed that I what I, I see as art, it may be some, not for the other person. And how they express themselves that is not how I express myself. Is they so um, this made me to stop and say, look, you need to stop creating expectations when you are doing your research, and you need to just the data come to you and it's gonna even like one thing I was reading yesterday about the silence. One of the students he just wrote a word, and in my head before I was creating other expectations because that's who I am, but this the lack of the space how he he created the words like the worthless the the criminal i could i could when i was analyzing i was i could see i could feel unconsciously i could feel i could i there is also data through the silence and as a researchers we need to to stop and try to listen the, the pause and the breaks and uh, 
and stop creating expectations. So, and also as, as a researcher, for example, one thing I think um, uh, uh, Sherry, she was saying about uh, not real traumatizing, um, that this, this technique also helped me to, because I want to go back and listen to their stories again, I said, no, you need to stop. One time is enough. So I think this, this process of trying to understand made me to, to grow as a researcher, but also as I had to, uh, also had to know my limit. No, I, there is no need for a second time. I can, I can just analyze the data that the data I have. So I think this is in, made me grow as a researcher. So I'll go next sort of following the order that we presented in and I've made some notes. Um, for me, any research, I really value the what I consider my mulling over time. And, and I hate to be pushed to do things quickly, which is, boy, just a challenge in an academic environment. Um, so I, I maybe come with an orientation where I really like to think, think about um, and have maybe a reflexive practice. For secondary data, I think that it has to be data that engages you to start with. If you just don't feel anything when you read it, if you're just not interested, then, then I think there's going to be a lot of issues with, with reflexivity. Um, but for me, every time I walk, um, and actually I've moved offices since I, since I wrote the chapter because I can't see as directly, but every time I walk past the place where um, the shootings occurred and there are spaces in a parking lot, um, I have this vibe, this sense of that, of that environment. And I can sort of hear the words. Um, and that's one thing I really like about having audio recordings is I can hear the words in my head. Um, and, and so um, that for me triggers that sort of reflexive, um, those reflexive um, um, processes. But the people that I worked with were um, less experienced researchers and less qualitatively experienced. And um, so we had, I'm going to say, almost some guided sessions, um, but we still had to, I wanted to make sure that we, we controlled um, our responses. Um, there's an old, you know, I tend to think constantly in comparisons, but there's an old quote from a football player who talked about controlled rage in football and just meaning that being the energy thing. And to me, there's a, there needs to be a, like a controlledness to your emotion and reflexivity, because if you just go free form, that's where you start getting the biases and the projections of your own things. And I'm actually working with some big data research now, which is something I never thought I'd do looking at Twitter and hearing young, younger researchers try to project way, way beyond what you can see. So with my group, you know, we, we sort of engaged in this, um, I'm going to say group, reflexivity process. Um, and I hope that, that we kept it um, appropriate and we were, we were really um, grounded in the data and not, but, but allowing ourselves, because there is, we use the Mutsakis, uh, Mutsakis book and there is the, the creative variation or whatever that's termed. So there is a little bit of space for that going, you know, beyond what you have. And, and, but, but I think of it more as trying to, to like, um, because I do a lot of IPA, not the, the, not the alcoholic drink, but the interpretative phenomenological analysis. Um, somebody once said walking in participants shoes. So I tend to think of, of trying to go back and forth between that, um, uh, that um, empathizing and then my own, my own sort of context and trying to find the place where those come together. And, and, I, and I was trying to guide uh, the rest of my team to, to, to go through that same process. But, you know, again, if, if, you, don't, if you have data, data set that just leaves you cold, um, you just don't care, it, it's, it's not going to work, whether it's primary or secondary. So, so I think it has to have that spark that inspires something with you or you have some relationship with it. Thanks for everybody going first so I can just say what they said. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I really appreciate um, what Cheryl said about the process of speed. I think that the, the pressure I feel to move quickly and to race through things it, it, in the context of the university is overwhelming. And it's, uh, it's very difficult to resist. Uh, doing comic art forces me to slow down a lot. And I think maybe independent of any benefit that I'm getting from the art space tools at my disposal, I think the fact that it forces me to slow down may actually be the greatest gift 
of all. In terms of, you know, reflexivity and thinking about, you know, the researcher versus the data versus the story versus the emotions versus everything, I would say that, you know, um, first of all, I always go back to the data. Like I keep, you know, going back, back to the data, back to the data. I was a ballet dancer when I was um, a teenager and they always tell us, go back to the bar, go back to the bar, go back to the bar, because no matter how you kind of launch into outer space, but you need to ground yourself at the bar. So I always go back to the data. The other thing is something that um, one of the greatest gifts that I think that all of us use, but I use particularly in my approach with comics-based research is the idea of the, um, the researcher's kind of subjectivity, what Alan Peshkin calls the hot spots and the cold spots. And I think that those are powerful tools to helping us pick apart either what we are avoiding and why, because it's usually important, or what we're drawn to and why, because it's also important. It's a fantastic tool. And, I, and one of my big, my big sort of uh, problems is my, my beloved colleagues uh, who are always about eliminating or creating objectivity as if it can be done as they are depriving themselves of that powerful tool. That said, just like a really powerful chainsaw can get a lot done in your yard, you don't want to just use it everywhere. <laughs> you know, it's, you don't want to be just wildly flinging this thing around and cutting cars in half and things like that. So like any tool that needs to be managed. And I keep talking about going back to the data, going back to the data, going back to the data, back to that bar. Um, and also um, I always have readers looking at my material um, so that I'm making sure I'm really getting across what I'm trying to get across. So I, I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. um, th thanks everybody for, for, um, for all of those um for all those thoughts about that. So I'm, I'm also wondering, um, Sally, you talked about the fact that you were a cartoonist before it was acceptable. And I'm just wondering for all of you, um, w was there any resistance to what you were doing? Um, did people try to, Cheryl, did people say, well, why aren't you doing primary data? And Michelle, did people, did people in your circle kind of question your approach and what do you do with that? And I know Sally, you talked about the haters out there and, and sometimes um, we, ha we can't ignore them. Sometimes we have to communicate and convince them and create a bridge. And so I'm just wondering if you can each kind of address um, the resistance, whether it's, it's um, at the micro level or more in your face. Mm -hmm. Don't change the order, keep the order. <laughs> <laughs> we can change the order. We don't have to go in the same order. <laughs> um, on mine, um, I remember when I was, when I started, because that's what I want to do in my dissertation. And uh, when I, I want to combine ethnographic with arts-based research. And, and um, I remember a few of my friends, they, for different departments, not in education, they told me, are you going to use arts in your research? That's not, that's not, uh, that's not research. That's not data. And, um, and I have been thinking a lot about this. And I think that's, that's, and even when we were this week, we were in a, in a pre conference about sometimes we define the academia, have this westernized idea of what, what means data, what is knowledge. And when you bring arts to your research, you are, I think, you are bringing more humanity. At the same time, you are bringing the voices of these communities because then in your history is denied or they don't have. Is not considered as a proper way of uh, data. So I think um, I start to sometimes to listen and even myself sometimes, um, should I or not? But I think that's, I think that's what unique. And I think, I think you see the humanity of the other person. And I think, and that's what I want my research. I don't want to be one more researcher or one more scholar. I want to do something that can impact my community, can show the emotions and can speak to itself. And I think through arts, that's how you reach, not only you reach the heart, I think that's, and that's what, me, that's what mean to me. And, uh, and I, I don't care to what people are going to say and, uh, but I know um, in the future, like I would maybe we hear, but I want to keep using more arts in my research and more, and I think that's when you bring the heart to. Thank you, thank you. So I'll stick with this and go second um, and say that the quantitative people were probably more supportive and of um, use of secondary analysis. You know, we had a term quantoid that somebody came up with at the TQR conference a few years ago that sticks in my head, um, but they do it all the time. So, um, so around my college, public health people, the idea of using data that's out there is sort of considered practical. And 
And when, when, it, um, when it makes it possible to use a larger sample size, which is always the big thing for qual quantitative people, then, it's, then they're like, they're really ha happy with that. You know, oh, why don't you do 600 interviews or something crazy like that? Um, but um, some of my qualitative co colleagues at this institution and elsewhere would only use uh, secondary data for class instruction, would never consider it as research data. Um, right away have sort of that wall up that if I didn't make it, if I didn't generate it, you know, if I wasn't directly involved from beginning to end, that it's just not good or it's not good enough. Um, I had a conversation with a student recently who did a meta study, like a systematic review and um, meta analysis. And I said, well, you, there is already one. Did you use their sources? And she said, no, I started from scratch. And I'm like, if we don't start building on the work of other people, then we are at risk of duplicating unknowingly what, and just creating more and more data, like the way that we create more and more garbage and waste and just having too much of it. Um, but, um, you know, I'll be, you know, we've had some brutal peer review um, and basically been told the, the thing that I hate the most from peer review, you can't do this, can't do it, never do this, always do this, never do this, have to do this. Um, and it's like everybody's a critic, right? Because Amazon tells you you are. So you all have a, are all qualified to, um, to, to express your opinions about things. Um, so I, it's a little bit of, a, of an uphill battle, but, you know, with students, they're very open to it uh, because they, a lot of them are, are, um, are have uh, more discomfort with interacting with people live and gravitate toward email interviews and I think that's a negative trend. I do like the idea of a real engaged interview with people, but, but I do find on the, on the other side, a more open-minded uh, approach to the idea of secondary analysis. So I think that as long as people keep a sense of proportion, this is just one method. It's not the only method. I'm not trying to replace what everybody else does, um, but it can really boost or supplement what you have um, and, um, you know, at this time, I, I actually was asked to do a presentation for students last summer um, who had lost the ability to do most of the research that they were doing. So they were looking for alternatives when the COVID stuff was very new. Um, so, so this is, so, you know, this may be a, a, a great time to, to keep moving forward, but there are always probably going to be people who for them, it does. It's not okay, and I and I just hope that that they um, come around to realize that it may still be okay for other people, even if it's not their preference. But um, but that is a, a lasting conflict in in research, I think, qualitative and quantitative. Thanks, thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, so, can you hear me? Okay, my air conditioner is kicked on. It's all right. Um, so, there, I think there's there's two different kinds of kind of critique that we get, and. In addition to this stuff, I also teach creative writing at the university. So I creative nonfiction and creative fiction writing. And something that I tell my students is you need to understand the difference between an actionable and a non-actionable critique, right? You suck is not actionable, right? Um, so when I think about the haters and the haters are gonna hate, I think about that as the non-actionable critique. And most of the non-actionable critique I've gotten as about this work has been tied up in a lot of sexism and a lot of classism in the academy. Not only do I not belong, but also my crazy little book doesn't belong or my, you know, oh, look at your cute little drawings, like that kind of stuff. And it's really infantilizing and really deeply um, misogynist. And I could go into examples of being told all these horrible things about, you know, how I don't belong and look at this stuff I'm doing. Um, you know, I'm a mediocre artist and a bad scholar and I'll never get a job. And I was actually told that by an advisor at the University of Colorado in my PhD program, that if I did this, I would never get a job and I would be a failure. And so I should sit on my hands and just do what I was told. And so I fired that advisor and that was it. And I sent him a letter when I made full. So the, uh, beyond that, there are also the actionable critiques, right? And those are the ones I think Paul was saying we need to build a bridge with, right? That, you know, the actionable critiques, people say, you know, uh, I don't understand this. Can you tell me more about X, Y, and Z? I don't think this fits. Can you explain it to me? That's a conversation you can have. Um, you know, you have no place here, little woman, is not a, an actionable critique. Those are the haters. But yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I find that most of the time, and this is increasing with time, when I first started doing this, I wrote my very first comic, uh, my first edition of Shane, the one of the when I was a first year faculty member. I was also massively pregnant with a child and trying to get the book out before the baby came and it was this really fraught time 
And when I wrote that, um, an editor at the press that actually published the book um, told me that if he had had this proposal come across his desk, it would have gone straight in the trash. And that's what he told me when the book came out. However, now, you know, I just finished a piece for, um, from a public um, health promotion practice. It's a public health journal. I'm sure um, Cheryl is familiar with it. And I wrote a comic for them and they had never seen this before. And they were very much, uh, the editors were kind of like, we don't, we don't know about, about this, but they weren't, they weren't giving me the non-actionable critiques. They were more like, okay, let's have a conversation about how we can bracket this and how we can talk about how this method speaks to the constructs in place with most of our readers. And so I actually think that with an actionable critique that, you know, it is calling into question the legitimacy of the method, but I'm able to have a conversation with them. And, and actually my work is better once I've made the changes that they're suggesting. So that is a bridge. So I can get there with those people, but the things that I have heard, um, uh, are uh, truly atrocious. <laughs> so those I just don't, you know, I remember their names, but I don't do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Cheryl, I wonder if you could talk, talk about um, with, with the, um, with the Kent State data, I think, I think you took a phenomenological approach and was there, were you kind of, did you, was that kind of an obvious choice or did, were you debating in your head? Uh, I wonder if you could just talk about when you when you get to secondary data um, and you're thinking about you know narrative or phenom phenomenological um, like what is that process really like for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this in this instance, um, we were thinking about how to 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 um, do some research on adolescent mental health um, and exposure to trauma, and um, I I would say that we you know we knew about the data. We started to think about what would be the best way to to get at what we wanted to to um, to express, and sort of going back and forth and having a general idea of how these um, transcripts were set up, and they really are set up, um, you know, as a sort of a lived experience um, retrospective. Um, some of them very very much um, like a you know chronological description of that day. Or of the days around that. So it it um, and I had had some experience um, with a practice analysis of a phenomenological um, study. I had not done anything um, real outside of a class other than interpretative phenomenological analysis, and I didn't see this as as really fitting in that because that is expressed um, typically conventionally by themes. And I wanted to try to get at this essence of experience and what were the commonalities across the, the different people and how, how, and try to, you know, I'm really trying to, to build sort of empathy in our readers. Um, and I think about that. What, what can they look at that makes them understand what it was like to be there and understand what it was like to reflect on it? So, so I mean, I'm not going to say it was, it, was, it was close to an obvious choice in, um, in looking at how the data were set up and what, we, what, we, what our aims were. But there was a little more to it than that of going back and forth, um, referring to our method source, to see what, you know, what do we need to have in our data? What do we need to make sure that we have? Um, and we felt like it was a good fit. Um, and, and, it and it addressed the, the presentation that we wanted to make that we thought would be um, the most compelling and engaging presentation. So, um, yeah, it was sort of a little back and forth between our interest in the data and, and ensuring that, um, that we had sufficient data um, and, and trying to figure out, um, and, and another thing that I'd forgotten about that I mentioned in the chapter, the, we used a, what Moussakis calls the modified von, von Kamm method that's really spelled out. It's like seven steps, very explicit. And with two newer researchers involved in this project, that was extremely helpful um, because there's always a lot of discomfort in early qualitative analysis. Am I right? Am I wrong? Is this the right code? Do I have too many codes, all those things. Um, this gave us a sort of a roadmap um, to go through. And we went through this one step at a time and then compared. And so it really, um, it, it really helped um, the team all take ownership and feel, and feel confident about what they were doing. So, so for a few reasons, um, convenience reasons and reasons to do with our, with our research aims, I, I feel like that was a good approach. And um, I'm sure that, that, that maybe doesn't sound entirely 
Um, that sounds a little contrived, but but that's the way it worked. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that, that that does make a lot of sense. Thanks, thanks. Um, Sally, I know that in, in your work, you talk a lot about um, hold, holding space for the parts in the whole and like engaging the parts in the whole. And um, I, don't, I wonder if you could just address how the the artistic space, the, the drawing and the cartoon space, um, how that allows you to do that in a different way than you might in a Word document. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually think it's not too different from the way I would do it in a Word document. Um, and, and I think that has to do much more with writing style and how I think about things. Um, you know, there's, I don't know how many of you, when you write, you first sort of try to like barf it all out on the page, just get everything down in a nonsensical way, just write and write and write and write. And write. Um, I think that with comic based work, it's a little more abstract than that because drawing takes time. Um, and so I have to think about bracketing things differently. So the point of the parts in the whole, um, I can't just write stream of consciousness. I have to actually have finite things. And so trying to not pressure myself to capture everything perfectly the first time around, but know that I'm only capturing teeny tiny little pictures of what is a larger narrative and getting comfortable with that is something I have to be much more in tune with when I'm drawing. Writing, I mean, yeah, you can write a snippet here, a snippet there, a snippet here, a snippet there. But I think when you're drawing, you'd have to be very conscious of how those pieces may or may not fit in. And the other thing you have to do is be aware that not everything you draw is gonna make it into the final piece. And this speaks to what Cheryl was talking about, about speed and efficiency. I think in the academy, I've gotten to the point where I'm so efficient um, at the cost of quality. And part of part of discovery is there's nothing efficient about discovery. It's, it's inherently wasteful in order to get the best product in the end. So some of the things, like sometimes I draw the thing or I even draw a page or two pages and then I have to throw them out, but I could not have gotten to the third page unless I drew those other two. So it's very much consciousness of process. It's a consciousness of parts that um, are perhaps foundational and not visible. I don't know if I'm, I'm rambling or answering your question, Paul, but it's, um, I think also, and this is true of qualitative data analysis, and it's one of the kind of mental acrobatics we have to keep abreast of while we do this work, is knowing that not everything is sequential. So maybe the piece or the part or the element or whatever we're working on is actually um, something from the very end and you do it first. Um, kind of like I tell my fiction students, like you don't know the story until you're done writing it. Um, so we have to be comfortable with that ace, uh, the, with, with not only having disembodied parts, but also having things that are non-sequential. So, and, and, and I think this also speaks to comfort with a mess and knowing that it's gonna come together and having faith that it's gonna come together, but it's gonna be just, uh, it's going to look messy um, before you get to that place, before you know what the story is, is going to um, be. Asking a follow-up to that, um, do you see the comic? Like with my, my plays, like I have this, suddenly I know that there's a play there. Or that story could be performed. I might not know any of the details, but like I know that that's going to happen somehow. How do you, like, how do you see the comic? Well, it depends. You know, I work in full panels, so I don't do the little boxes anymore. Like I, in my in my Shane books, there's a lot of pages, little boxes. I don't do those anymore. Um, so it's a little bit the se sequentialness of it is kind of muted for me. And before I can even get to what the story is, it's almost like I need to go to this funny place. And, and artists know this. It's not just you draw the picture. You have to go to the emotional place to draw the picture. So I have to go to this place where I'm in the data and I'm immersed in the, in the data and the memos and the journals and the material and the photographs such that I can then produce the metaphor that will drive the piece. For the piece that I talked about in this and which I talk about at greater length in the chapter in the book, um, for me, it was getting to the place where I knew that the image, the image that's going to center and ground and drive that story was the mouth, the big mouth with all the teeth. Um, and that's not anywhere in the data. There's no mouths, there's no teeth in the data. Nobody's talking about the lion's mouth. I was talking about that. But having that as the central organizational image is what allowed me to hang everything else around it. And in that piece, there is a story. There is like a beginning, middle, and end. It isn't like I'm just throwing disembodied images at people. Um, although there are times when I've gotten kind of close to that. I have a piece coming out in Anthropology News next month, for example, that is <laughs> very much that way. But that you have to find the central image. What is the metaphor? What is the the temperature 
of the work. And then you tell the story around that. But to get to that central image, like I sat in my office when I was writing Research in Pain, which is the piece, and it was also in Anthropology News, um, had the mouth. And I sat in my office and I cried. I cried for a week reading through the data. And I mean, I had little kids, these little kids in like Indiana who told me, they said, you know, um, I, I'm trying to be strong and get ready to die because someone at school had told them that if Trump wins, he's going to kill all the transgender people. And this kid was trying to be so, this kid's six. I was trying to be so stoic, this little trans boy. And so how do you do that and not just be reduced? So I sat in my office and I went to this place and yeah, it wasn't terribly objective, but as long as you can then go back and like, you know, put away your chainsaw and think objectively about it, you, you, you can access that place, develop the metaphor and hang everything else around it. Did that make any sense or was that just super weird? Made sense. Okay, good. good. Mm -hmm. Totally makes sense. I do the same, I think. That, that makes me feel better. <laughs> Someone else does it. Uh, Michelle, I, I wonder if you could talk about the, the drawings that the students did in your study and how, what did you do in terms of analyzing those, those, those drawings? What I did was, was like, I think was like three process. First, the, the meditation part, and after the or conversation. No, so we sit in the table and they were drawing. And after the third time, we talked. So uh, because I think just my own interpretation was not going to be, I had to listen to their, I want, because I could create my own, my own ideas. I, and after when I got home and I could analyze, but I want to understand their what they want to to share through their through their painting. So I think this was because a lot of things that they were telling me, if I just looked to the image, I was not gonna get it. And I think there was necessary to have this conversation so I could go way deep and understand even more the the issues there. So I think. Uh, so that's and so after I transcribed our uh, conversations and uh, and I was just analyzing and how and that's when I thought about the silence, the spaces. When I you start to analyze why he's why this person is using those words and why in connecting with the, what he or he or she was telling me. So I think um, and this made me to reflect. In, um, about my how I write too, how how I, I I should write and how I should share share their uh, their experiences and um so I think this this three process was necessary to be connected because the our conversation helped me to understand what they want to tell me so uh, so I think uh, yeah thank you thank you um, that that helps me that helps me understand the process of going from the drawings to to um, to, to more of an understanding, yeah. um, an analytical understanding. So, so folks, we don't have a lot of time left. Are there are there other questions that the group has? Yeah, Michelle, I, I'm I'm very interested in in the process of the yoga. I mean, uh, and meditation, and, and I myself. I mean, I I, I do an hour yoga every morning, um, first thing, um, and I find it, yeah, a, a really way to connect with. Um, you know, my work that I'm about to do in the day. Um, but I mean, how old were the children that you were um, working with? Um, middle school. Um, actually, they, this was a school where, that made me so mad because this is a school where the students, they passed the age of high, of being middle school. So they were, they, they got, they were supposed to be in high school. So they were in that school until because they were considered by the system as a tribal kids or kids who can't speak properly or is not good academically because of the language limitations. So um, one of them, uh, he, he barely could, uh, he didn't know how to speak English at all. And he had to take the ACIT in English, but um, it's just... Um, Make me really mad. <laughs> so uh, that's um, they are between middle school and high school. And I really, like you said, um, I want to do this in my dissertation. So that's what I really want to do. And I want to go even more uh, deeper. And um, I can't wait to be able to do that because um, I think this, this, this methodology is, uh, spoke to my soul, I think. And uh, 
I want to keep doing this and this. And that's how I do too for myself. I, every morning I need to have this connection with meditation because I think this is fun, at least fundamental in my life and made me reflect about us as a researcher. What you think was the key to winning them over? I think they were like, why you want to listen to my story? My Why I matter? I think because their entire life, like the entire process, as an immigrant in this country, you always think that you are never good enough. You so, and I think was the key was sharing my story with them, sharing with them that I haven't seen my family for six years because according to the immigration, I'm off excuse of studying in the United States or I'm lying. So, um, so make me uh, showing them that I'm also um, in vulnerability and I understand what they are going through. A lot of, and another thing that I also learned was before I just wanted to interview non-English speakers, but I also, a lot, two of the, the children, uh, they were, um, they were fluent in English. Um, the other, uh, they had other shoes, but um, I don't know if shoes is the proper word to say, but um but their stories was so important to the data that I collected. So I can't also limit it because even though they speak English, they told me I had to be a grown up since I was a child because I had to protect my parents and I can't ignore this data. So, um, so that's why I think the key was sharing my story with them and sharing why this is important because it's also, because I understand I had, I, because yeah i think this was the key sharing my story with them i think was very make them to trust on me to share their own stories especially when i talk about immigration status one more question if it's okay i'd like to ask sally a question um so i'm not so uptight about my drawing because i've been sketching forever but my handwriting is just unbelievably atrocious um, and people can't read it. And um, I only got ahead in life because word processing um, became a big thing. Because when I started at work, I, I'm a late to academics. I had real jobs, I like to say, for a long time. And we had to handwrite memos when I started and nobody knew what I was saying. Do you have any advice for people who are challenged with the lettering part um, of that kind of work? Is the hardest part. It takes <laughs> forever. It takes forever, forever, forever. And it is so hard. And, but I actually, one of my publishers, I want to say Rutledge made a font called Sally. So I could use that instead of, but it doesn't work because you can't, like, it's not spaced right. You can't make it bend and everything. So I still do the hand lettering. It's really hard. My handwriting is awful. It's absolutely awful. But I treat the hand lettering as a meditation. Um, I use a tablet, which has changed everything for me because I can zoom really, really big. Um, and I have a, I have a disorder where I have tremors in my hands. So by making the thing big, I can draw straight. Um, and then I, it just takes a really long time and I just draw the individual little letters and then I go back through and fix them with the eraser. And it takes an hour to draw a paragraph, but it looks, there's, there's nothing like it. And I spoke a little bit at the beginning about economy and how you have to really think about which words you're gonna use. And when you have to write like that, and you can type it all out so you know what you're saying or you know whatever, and then transfer it. But when you have to work that way, it, it does something to your analytic ability that I think is really important. So my advice is don't worry, everybody has horrible handwriting. Um, and to treat it just like the art and get a tablet.